my name is Warren Ginsburg. With my great and good friend, my colleague, Gina Saki, we have uh, organized the symposium that is accompanying the meeting of the Dante Society of America. We are very honored to have the society meet here. Uh, the society was founded in 1881. This is the first time that it is meeting at a West Coast University. <laughs> I would like to introduce our good friend and colleague, uh, Professor of German and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Susan Anderson, to offer some words of welcome. On behalf of the Office of the Provost and Academic Affairs, it is my great pleasure to welcome the members of the Dante Society of America to the University of Oregon and to welcome all of you who are participating or attending this symposium. You are about, about to embark on what promises to be a fascinating exploration of Dante and his work in a variety of transmutations. The focus on translation is particularly apt for this campus and our expanding interdisciplinary group of faculty and students working in translation studies called the Translation Studies Working Group. Translation studies embraces both practice and theory, questioning assumptions about language, meaning, context, culture, the foreign, authorship, media, and singularity, just to name a few. Translation also embraces parody, and one example is that of a leading German writer from the previous century. Thomas Mann, who refers to Dante's Vita Nuova and Commedia in his novel Der Zauberberg, or The Magic Mountain. As Thomas Rendell has argued, Mann challenges the notion of a redemptive and ennobling love in his representation of the long relationship between the characters Hans Kastorp and Klavdia Shoshat, at times referred to as Beatrice. Both patients in a Swiss sanatorium suffering from tuberculosis. Kastorp's choice to keep one of Shoshat's chest x-rays as a memento of the consummation of their love affair marks the turning point in his journey from physical to spiritual love all accompanied by quotations in imagery from Dante. Mann's transformation of parts of Dante's texts aided him in his parody of the genre of the Bildungsroman of Enlightenment ideologies and of pre-World War I European society. This is but one medium in my field, German literature, into which Dante's writings have been transformed. The Dante Society's program on the possibilities and challenges of translation offers us all a magnificent opportunity to learn from accomplished translators and experts in theories of translation about myriad other ways of translating Dante. I wish all of you a stimulating exchange of ideas and again, a hearty welcome. I'm Gina Saki in the Department of Romance Languages. The Dante, the Dante, everything he wrote, but the Divine Comedy in particular, is a portable text. It's an inexhaustible text, meaning that translations are potentially infinite. Our symposium opens, and on your program we have reprinted Dante's resigned admonition from the Convivio. Everyone should know, then, that nothing harmonized with the bonds of music can be translated from its own language into another without the destruction of all its sweetness and harmony. E però sappia ciascuno che nulla cosa per legame musaico armonizzato si può dalla sua loquela in altra transmutare senza rompere tutta sua dolcezza e armonia. Whatever sweetness and harmony are lost in translation, in translation the poem gains new resources, new dimensions, and new resonances. The papers and discussions integrated into this annual meeting of the Dante Society 
quite varied in themselves, are the tip of the iceberg, really. The creation of the poem is strongly anchored in its original language and context. Dante's uh, mother tongue, Dante's invented terza rima, Dante's intellectual horizon, Dante's political matrix. For modern audiences, sound and sense are both in need of translation and mediation. Our guests are like spotlights, illuminating Dante from different angles and in different colors. Dante's Inferno and Mary Jo Bang's bold new poem. The whole comedy through the lens of academic medieval studies, from philology to philosophy to theology to rhetoric to literary history, literary theory, literary criticism. The whole comedy in a bold new American English idiom and in Sandow Burke's astonishing series of paintings and lithographs. The Inferno made into an updated, quintessentially modern medium, film, and a wickedly contemporary American social and political context. The comedy, taken out of its prestige dialect of Tuscan and transposed into the myriad of other Italic uh, dialects and vernaculars. The Paradiso, taken out of the bonds of its music and rendered into music in a setting for voices that is actually multimedia, incorporating dance, choreography, singing, and staging, and video. A paradiso, in other words, in which the load-bearing metaphor of Dante's cosmos, harmony, is literalized into a musical setting. These approaches, tra traditional or innovative, academic or creative, textual or artistic, and all of the above, are all translations. Translation studies is a discipline relatively recently rehabilitated in academia, <clears throat> rescued in the past 20 years from a disregard that when I joined the academy bordered on contempt. Book-length translations from medieval languages were counted toward tenure as an article. In effect, only the scholarly introduction was considered to be academic work. The rest was typing. <laughs> Mechanical transposition from one transparent code to another. The intellectual naivete of that dismissal is stunning, and happily it is almost, almost dead. Translation is now the subject of academic inquiry that it deserves to be, particularly given that it is one of the major modalities of intellectual work in the Middle Ages. For Dante, for his contemporaries, for his successors, even those of us who read Dante in his original language are constantly, if unwittingly, translating him. And those who read Dante in translation are the beneficiaries of millions of translation decisions whose subtleties are the topic of this meeting. Back to Warren for a moment. Just to introduce a different register, uh, during the late 1950s, the U.S. Senate had a hearing about baseball as a possible monopoly. And they called to testify Casey Stengel, who was the manager of the New York Yankees. Now, Casey Stengel was famous for starting long, elaborate explanations, which at the beginning everybody understood, but by the time he was done, no one knew what he was talking about. <laughs> After he was done, the senator, uh, Casey Stengel, and I forgot to mention, Mickey Mantle, who was the best known Yankee of that time. After uh, Stengel was done, the senator uh, turned to Mickey Mantle and said, Mr. Mantle, what would you like to say? And Mantle said, I agree with everything Casey said. <laughs> I agree with everything that Gina said. <clears throat> ditto and ditto again. But I would just like to add a personal note about the, the role, really, that translation has played in my own uh, thinking and writing. It began when I, the first year I was a graduate student and was taking a course in Chaucer at the same time that I was taking a course in Dante. So I had on the one side Talbot Donaldson, who was the most uh, famous reader of Chaucer at the time, and at the other, on the other side, John Fichero. Well, I was just 
amazed not only by the similarities and vast differences between Canterbury Tales, let's say, and the Divine Comedy, but even more so between the uh, by the differences and similarities in the questions that both scholars were asking of the text, and as I started reading the criticism, what critics asked of the text. And from that point on, I was really engaged in a cultural, cross-cultural translation to understand the kinds of philological, philosophical explorations that Italian critics were asking, but at that time also within the context of a national literature, and the different kinds of new critical questions that were being asked uh, by Chaucerians at that time. And from that moment on, I have always been thinking in two or more uh, different languages and approaches. But as you get older, you realize that, as Gina has said, intralingual translation is as important as interlingual translation. We are constantly translating in the language, our native language, whatever language it is that we are speaking in. And those kinds of translations become a habit of mind and one that I think it's very useful for us to try to cultivate. So once again, uh, we both of us agreed that translation in Dante and Dante in translation would be a wonderful way of organizing the symposium to accompany this meeting of the Dante Society of America. Welcome. tell you just a, a, a couple of tips littered about the room are schedules for our symposium and uh, we wanted you to know that there that this continues tomorrow with some other with some other wonderful talks and a wonderful round table and Warren, you c cannot pry this man away from a microphone. This is true, but I forgot the most important thing. I have to thank the many, many people and entities at the University of Oregon uh, who have made this all possible. So uh, I would like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences, the Medieval Studies Program, the Justina Family Professorship in Italian Language and Literature, the Oregon Humanities Center, the Department of English, yes, I got them to contribute, <laughs> the Department of Comparative Literature, the Journal Comparative Literature, the Department of Romance Languages, and the Creative Writing Program. And just one more word of thanks on a different note again. The reason we have this perfectly wonderful program and not a more glossy version is that the man who we were working with in the printing services of the university, he suddenly passed away just this last Friday. John McMillan was a wonderful person to work with and uh, it was a complete shock. Uh, and I just wanted to pay public thanks to him for the work that he did do. He was responsible for putting together the postcards and the posters for the uh, symposium and meeting that you see. And, and since we're um, thanking everyone, I'm going to thank another couple of people, Heidi Giese and Carol Kleinhexel, who uh, do all the organizational uh, work, heavy lifting, of which there is a lot, and Bethany Robinson in the College of Arts and Sciences office, who also has done a lot of this. Um, to, and I want to thank you for coming. <laughs>